Uh, I'm a bit nervous after this introduction. <laughs> uh, well, he's not for you, actually. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but thank you for this opportunity to, to share with you uh, some research that I think is really both amusing and interesting. And I hope that you will find it as amusing and interesting as I do after this presentation is over. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, for no more than 45 minutes at least. I don't know if I'll keep... Uh, keep on for 45 minutes, we'll see, but at least no more. Okay, yes, so uh, glossy magazines and uh, comics for grown-ups, uh, that's the issue, uh, that's the material we're going to talk about. Now, let's see, what do we have here? In the middle we have Santa Claus harassing young girls uh, in uh, central Cairo, uh, getting more and more agitated as he uh, encounters more and more girls. We have uh, Spongebob life-size puppets being used to uh, sell drugs to people at the social clubs in Cairo. I'll get back to that. I promise you I will get back to Spongebob. Huh? But uh, that's, we're going to leave him there for, for now. And then uh, at this end, uh, you can't read it, but th these are pictures of uh, some women uh, wearing niqab. Uh, it's from uh, a magazine called Echna. And they say that the society refuses to relate to us. Uh, and these women are part of, at that time, a brand new Salafi TV channel in which uh, all, uh, all the female employees uh, wore the niqab at all times, also during presentations of news and so on. So there are pictures of them sitting you know, at news desks, like totally <laughs> black, black ghosts, you can't see anything. And they're reading the news on TV. It's uh, quite, uh, quite amusing. Now, um, these are all examples. These two are from Tuk Tuk, and this uh, front page here is from Ehna. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll it's, uh, <laughs> I, I can take that uh, after a while, but yeah, it's a, it's a disclaimer. Um, so these are uh, examples of uh, prominent examples of two new kinds of media in uh, in Egypt. Um, the glossy magazines, uh, they're not exactly new, but most of the glossy magazines that existed when I came to Cairo for the first time in 1998 were uh, in English. Uh, now, you have more uh, magazines like Ehna that are written in Arabic. And Tuk Tuk, that's, as far as I know, brand new, that you have uh, a comics magazine for grown-ups grown written in, uh, in Arabic. Uh, you, of course, you've had, you had comics in the Arab world and Egypt for a long time, but they must have been like Mickey Mouse and so on, for pedagogy, pedagogical purposes, not for grown-ups. So there are new media. And uh, in this media, there are two features that stand out. First, uh, there is a willingness in them to take on controversial social and political issues in a funny way. And so, uh, rather obviously, this, uh, if you read the story, this Santa Claus harassing women in Cairo is really a humorous take on the serious problem, problem of sexual harassment in Egypt, which is really a huge, a huge problem. Um, and uh, this interview with uh, the Salafi women uh, in this uh, TV channel, that's an attempt by Ehna to give voice to a section of Egypt's women who are often seen as simultaneously reactionary and oppressed by the rest of society. Now this is uh, one feature, that they take on social and politi political issues. Then the second tendency is that they do that in the vernacular, in the Amiya, in the vernacular code to a great extent, instead of classical Arabic or Fusha, which is the language variety that you're supposed to write in as an Arab when writing for print publications. So I'm going to talk about the print, printed language, written language in this media today. I've got two questions that I'm going to try and answer. First, obviously, why do the producers of Ehna and Tuk Tuk choose to write in Amiya to a great extent? What, uh, what, what's the reason for this? And then, secondly, what are the implications of writing in Amiya rather than Fusha in these uh, new publications? That's, uh, that's the two questions I'm going to pose and try to answer. And since I don't know if I can keep your attention uh, for this uh, whole presentation, uh, because I haven't tried this before, I'll go ahead and give the short answer right away. And the short answer to both questions is that they choose to write in Amiya, 
partly because they're part of a new culture of informality that seems to be spreading in the Egyptian public sphere. And as for the social and political implications of writing an Amiya, it establishes their credentials as 100% Egyptian when they write about thorny social and political issues that could have put them at risk of being associated with foreign agendas and enemies of the Egyptian nation. That's the short answer. Now comes the long answer. Uh, and for that we need some background. Now, uh, this is uh, very well known to uh, many of you, and it's also um, pretty simplified, so, um, so bear with me uh, with the simplifications here. Now, Arabic is divided pretty sharply into two, uh, a situation called diglossia by linguists. On the one hand, you have a formal standard language, which is based on the model of the Quran, at least ideally, uh, uh, the Quran and a corpus of early Islamic writings. And uh, if, uh, if you want to seriously popularize this, you can call it like a living Latin in a way. It's a serious and formal language. And uh, Fusha means the most eloquent tongue. That's the name for this code. It's common for all the Arab countries, but it's nobody's mother tongue. You learn it at school. Then on the other hand, we have the dialects. They're spoken in all everyday contexts and they differ from country to country. The dialect is your mother tongue. Now these two varieties have separate spheres of use. Traditionally, the classical Arabic is used in all formal contexts. It's used in TV news and always when writing. Always when writing. That's tr the traditional view. The dialect is used for informal purposes and it's considered not serious in a way. Many regard it as just a distortion of the real, the real Arabic, the real classical Arabic fusha. And as I said, and this is important, fusha has been traditionally the default variety for writing Arabic. So, fusha is connected to formality and seriousness, while amiya is connected to the informal, the everyday, and of course the funny. And fusha is also generally considered to carry much more prestige as a vehicle of public communication. It's got immense symbolic value because of its status as the language of revelation in Islam and its link to the ideology of pan-Arabism. I know, for, uh, just for the fun of it and for uh, possibly the benefit of those of you who are not you know, very into uh, diglossia, I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Uh, that's spoken language, but uh, they're a bit fun and I think, oh well, they're a bit fun when seen together. And I think uh, that they give a nice sense of the contrast between Fusa and Amiya. One video in Fusa first and one in Amiya afterwards. The Fusa video I'm going to show you is Omar Suleiman, former head of uh, Egyptian intelligence, who announces the abdication of Hosni Mubarak on, uh, the, uh, in February at the, the Evil Revolution. Here he is, not so happy. This is, uh, and this is delivered in Fusa. I'm sorry there are no subtitles for this short one. There are subtitles for the other one, but not for this. But what it basically is saying is that in these dire and very difficult circumstances, uh, the president has decided to step down. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Ayyuhu al-Mu'atunun. Fi hadihi al-Duroof al-Asiba. Al-Latihi tamurru biha al-Bilad. قرر الرئيس محمد حسني مبارك تخليه عن منصب رئيس الجمهورية وكلف المجلس الأعلى للقوات المسلحة لإدارة شؤون البلاد والله الموفق والبستعان. That's it. Omar Suleiman not very happy talking in Fusha. Now keep in mind uh, the tone of his voice and the general deliverance while we. Uh, watch a short clip from Basim Yusuf show. Uh, many of you know Basim Yusuf, a kind of uh, Egyptian John Stewart, who, uh, whose program is now discontinued because he got too uh, political uh, to the liking of the Egyptian authorities. But he, uh, throughout the revolutionary period he, period, he was critical to all powers that be and he made fun of, uh, of, of the powerful. And in this clip he makes specific fun of the Salafis. 
The clip is from uh, sometime late in 2012 during the presidency of Mohammed Morsi from the Muslim Brothers and there had been a big interview with Mohammed Morsi on Egyptian state TV and the interviewers, the two interviewers got a lot of criticism also from the Salafis they got criticism for not being properly uh, attired and, and so on and here Basim Yusuf makes fun of that criticism and especially the homophobia of the Salafis احمد ربنا انتوا بتكلموا الرئيس احمد ربنا انتوا طلعتوا من هناك على رجليكم ما تفهمتوش الاسود وبعدين تطولوا الحوار اساسا كان مليان اخطاء مهنيه انتوا ما سمعتوش الشعب قال عليكم ايه كل بيشتكي من المحاورين اللي كانوا بيحاوروا الرئيس للامس ده قله ادب وتفاله يا راجل لا دي غير دي غير وقال لي زنانه واحده متبرجه كانوا في عمرها متبرجه ليه يا شيخ راجل وبعدين جابوا لك راجل جابوا لي راجل والله هتقول راجل يا جدعان تجيبوا له راجل يا جماعه انا لو فاضي اروح له والله العظيم بس مشغول انا بس الفيديو اللي احنا شايفينه دلوقتي انا عايز اسال سؤال واحد بس هي العربيه اللي كانت معديه تحت دي قدامها دي بولينيز دي هي اه قنوات دينيه بس مليانه شقاوه برضه Yeah, he's funny. <laughs> now, if you listen to the way they spoke here, the speed, the tone, the pronunciation, the general atmosphere, this is the difference between Fusa and Amir that I want to get across to you. There's, there's a great difference. Arabic is the language used in both of these video clips, but yet they speak two different languages. Um, and there are extremes, but I think they get across the point. Fusa is serious, distanced, the language of authority, while dialect is witty, fast-paced, informal. There's also a second point, uh, which is that, uh, and which I'll come back to uh, later, uh, and this point is that Omar Suleiman's language is the language of, of power and authority, while Basim Yusuf, his is the language of criticism of that power, which I think also is important. Okay, now, this difference, the, the divide between Fusa and Amiya, is much clearer in writing than in speech, traditionally. Uh, in speech, different blends of Amiya and Fusa has been usual. But in writing, there has been less room for using dialect. Amiya is just something you speak, and it's not usually employed for writing because it's not serious enough. So in order to be taken seriously as a writer, you need to be able to express yourself in Fusa. But during the last 10 years or so, there has been a tendency to write more in Amiya. Books, magazines and comics for grown-ups have appeared, some funny, some serious, all written in Amiya or a mix between Amiya and Fusha. And this development coincided with progressive political activism that played a large part in the Arab Spring, where paternalist regimes were toppled. So the question is then, why do some publications choose to write in Amiya and what are the social and political implications of this choice? And I've tried to, uh, this is work in progress, but so far I've looked at, uh, in depth at two, um, two publications. Ehna, um, which is a monthly magazine, or rather was a monthly magazine, and Tuk Tuk, which appears something like, six times a year or something. Um, and I will look at them in turn, when and why they use Amiya, and then say something about the implications of them doing that. We'll start with Ihna. These are two uh, front pages from, uh, they're both from 2012, aren't they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, Ihna was published from 2004 until December 2012, when it was discontinued, probably for economic reasons. But a running time for eight years in Egypt, that's quite a lot for such magazines. There are a number of magazines like Echna that have got like one or two or three issues and then they disappear. But Echna actually run and was published each month for eight years. Judging from the advertisements, the target group is relatively well-off people in their 20s to 30s. You have, uh, you have uh, 
ads for Virgin Megastore and for Blackberries and for fancy mobile subscriptions and that kind of stuff inside the magazines and upscale clothes stores. Now, the content in Ehna is pretty varied, which you can see from these two front pages. I'll just take you quickly through them. Um, this issue here is that's that's more, that's a typical issue uh, where you have a, a, why a great blend of articles. There's an interview with two uh, central characters behind uh, the what's called festival music, a new kind of I can't call it pop music, but a new kind of music that's become very popular in Egypt. Then there's an article about a private university called the Nile University, which was embroiled in a major scandal uh, with. Uh, conflicts between students and the owners. Then there's an article uh, about the difference between hooligans and ultras in Egypt, obviously important because of the role ultras played in the revolution. And then the last one is a typically uh, like scandal-mongering uh, article about alleged sa satanic worship among Egyptian youths. So a pretty wide band of, of articles, and inside there's lots more uh, funny and strange stuff. Now this one is a bit uh, untypical, <coughs> but I include it because I wanted to show you that they don't shy away from serious issues. Uh, on the front page here, you, you can all see what that is. A soldier, a, a military man, kicking a demonstrator. And there is just a quote on the front page saying, the dignity of the Egyptian above everything else. And the, the quote is from the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. And then obviously the contrast to, to them kicking a demonstrator. And the whole issue is devoted to eyewitness accounts of how the military mistreated uh, demonstrators and the population uh, while they were in power uh, from February 2011 until uh, Mursi came to power. So the content is quite varied. I've analyzed three consecutive Ehna issues uh, from September through November 2012. And as you all know, this was a pretty volatile period in, in Egypt marked by extreme polarization between Islamists and non-Islamists uh, and, and the army. And there was a chaotic political process where everything was up in the air and basically everybody mistrusted everybody else. So Ehna had to navigate this chaotic and volatile political landscape. And uh, I think they really enjoyed it. <laughs> At least the editor did when I met him in late 2011. At that time and then afterwards until they were discontinued, Ehna brimmed with articles that treated prominent social, cultural and political issues. And its profile wasn't particularly confrontational or angry, but it was rather open, sometimes bordering on the naive, when it treated issues like Islamism, uh, the job market and, uh, and political issues. Okay, uh, Ehna is a pretty chaotic magazine uh, with, with many different genres in it and, uh, and content that ranges from, uh, from an article I saw about the 10 most famous haircuts in international football. There's an article about that. Uh, there, there are articles about uh, the traffic jams in Cairo and there is serious and critical comment on President Morsi's performance. And to cover this wide array of um, content, they use three linguistic styles. First you have predominantly uh, Amiya, with perhaps a word or two of Fursa in there, but it's, it's basically Amiya. Then you have uh, basically only Fursa, a word or two in, in Amiya perhaps, but Fursa. And then a mix, where there is not exactly even even, but uh, fair amounts of both varieties. So three uh, linguistic uh, varieties used. And uh, in the three issues I studied, there are 76 articles all in all. And if we use these three main linguistic categories, uh, I found that 56% were written in Amiya, 23 in Fusha, and 21 in a mixed, uh, mixed variety. So what determines which variety is used? What, what are the reasons for choosing one variety over the other? And I'll begin with what the people in charge say when I interviewed Karim Degwi, the editor. He said that all of Ihna is to be written in an accessible style, and much of it in the colloquial, and the aim is to attract readers who don't normally read much. 
because he thought that Amiya was easier to read for most people than Fusa. Now there is some support for that view, uh, which I'll show you uh, show you later based on a survey we did. People do find it many people find it easier to read stuff in Amiya than Fusa. But I mean to read Amiya you still need to be properly literate, in other words you can't read the, the stuff, and also AMIA isn't properly codified, so it's not necessarily e easier. And then third, this, uh, his explanation doesn't explain why you sometimes have articles in AMIA and at other times you have FUSA and then other times you're going to mix. So it's not a satisfactory answer. But before I got to uh, ask uh, Karim Medegui about uh, anything more, EHNA was discontinued and uh, it's been impossible uh, for us to have another interview, although we tried four times on Skype. So, uh, uh, as I, I haven't been able to probe more uh, into this, but I did my own investigation uh, to check for other explanations. I looked through the 76 articles in these three issues of Ihna and saw what kind of language was used in what kind of article. And I won't bore you with the, the details, I'll give a summary of the results. What I did was to construct indexes of genre and content to see if these two uh, variables correlate with the choice of language. Now I'll show you to hopefully make it more understandable. Now here you have the correlation between genre and language variety. So I found 10 genres. You can't read them all, it's not so important. But the genres are here, interview, reviews, opinion, personal reflections, news report, several genres. For each genre you have three uh, uh, three uh, columns indicating FUSA, the green one, mixture of FUSA and AMIA, which is the light blue, and only AMIA, which is the dark blue. And uh, what I think when looking at this, uh, this chart is that it isn't very clear. Uh, it doesn't explain very much. For two of the genres, advice, articles and poems, you can see that they're only written in AMIA. There's, uh, there's nothing else. But the other one, it's you know, it's distributed without any. The pattern isn't very clear. It doesn't really. There is no very very clear correlations for the other genres. So genre doesn't explain why you choose one variety over the other. Does content? It's difficult to code content in Ihna because it's it's uh, <laughs> idiosyncratic in a way. But I tried. I made some ad hoc categories: history, self-help, sport personal thoughts. The same goes for this one. It's, it's not, you know, very clear why you get uh, one kind of variety in, in one type of content, not another. Like sport. You have two articles in AMIA. <laughs> you have a sports article in FUSA. Now that's perhaps the content where I would least expect them to use FUSA. So it doesn't really explain, it doesn't really explain very much. So I used a lot of time on this uh, and it didn't uh, help much. <laughs> so then I just started uh, thinking of something else. Now, uh, I think uh, this, this is a better explanation. So, um, we have to look outside uh, itself, outside of the magazine, to find the best explanation for the distribution of codes, to explain the fact that you have predominantly AMIA, but we also have other uh, varieties. I think that the choice between FUSA and AMIA is to a great extent about stylistic models. And by this I mean that you have uh, in recent years, uh, to 15 last years perhaps in Egypt, through the press and a spate of recently published, published books, there is a new and often quite young style which has grown increasingly popular. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it refers to literature, it's called al adab al sarcastic literature, and sometimes they call it sarcastic style, al slob And this term designates essays, biographies, and novels that are written in a humorous and often self-ridiculing style. And they often, not always, but often, they will treat serious issues in a light-hearted way. It's, if you will, it's social criticism with a smile. And to, to a pretty large extent, I think, this seems to be the main factor in Ehna. Uh, because we have articles treating serious issues, and the articles themselves are written in a serious uh, tone, they're not meant to be funny, it's, it's going to be in Fosha. Then you have articles treating serious issues, but they're a, 
a bit more uh, the, the, the authors try to make fun of things they invariably choose uh, Amiya this example is a pretty good one I think uh, the title of the piece is Ice uh, Demokratia Khud which I think translates as something like do you want democracy? Catch um, the article uh, is not mindless entertainment because the author clearly intends to educate the audience about democracy and that's a serious serious issue if ever there was one I think um, and a central part of the article is devoted to explaining the problem of majority rule uh, and uh, he treats majority rule by uh, by this example here so imagine that you're going to Sharm el-Sheikh with three of your friends and they've decided to play a time at Hosni album all the way in the car instead of Muhammad Munir. Torture, right? But there's the tyranny of the majority for you. Now, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Egyptian pop music. I would certainly sympathize with this, uh, <laughs> with this uh, sentiment. I, I'm not particularly fond of either Muhammad Munir and Tamil Hosni, but I think Muhammad Munir is very much better at least. Uh, so the point is that, he's, um, that he uses a humorous tone uh, and everyday situations and examples from pop culture to talk about a serious issue, namely how democracy works and what you got to accept when you live in a democracy. There are many such examples in Yehna and uh, they're always written in Amiya. And this is connected to the cultural informality which seems to have taken hold in uh, many literary circles in Egypt and which I will return to towards the end, a culture of informality. But first, we'll have a look at Tuk Tuk. <coughs> Tuk Tuk is a comics magazine aimed, uh, as you can see, not at children. Uh, primarily at young adults. There is even a keep away from children warning on its front page, which it acquired after uh, some copies were removed from shops uh, in Egypt because parents were angry because their kids had gone to buy the comics magazine and they came home <laughs> with pictures like this, you know. <coughs> um, now, uh, you know, this is this is a title page from uh, number five. Uh, this figure is called Super Mac. He actually has a showdown with the Santa Claus you saw in the beginning, uh, because he wants to stop Santa Claus from harassing women. So that's it's a funny story. This is a story about the man who has uh, hang-up on uh, makeup and uh, skin. And, yeah, I won't go into the details, but it's uh, it's an absurd and, and quite funny story. But it's not for kids. Now, uh, Tuk Tuk was conceived of in uh, 2009, and it's a collaborative effort by a group of young independent Egyptian artists and writers to create a comics series for grown-ups. And this is a completely new idea. Uh, Mohamed Shinawi, who is the main editor, he explained the, the aim of Tuk Tuk in this way. We wanted to make stories, not only newspaper cartoons, stories for grown-ups, light stories in Amiya about real issues in the street, not pedagogical stuff. It would contain themes relating to government, to the family, all the traditions. We want to challenge them. And this they have certainly uh, done. The content in Tuk Tuk ranges from the amusing through the absurd to dark social realism. And uh, we have an example of the both the amusing and absurd here. Uh, this is a story about uh, an Egyptian farmer who has watched uh, the Mustafa Mahmoud show, a famous uh, Egyptian religious preacher, who had these kinds of glasses. So he has gone and buy, bought the same glasses as his hero Mustafa Mahmoud, and he learns about uh, something called the third brain on the Mustafa Mahmoud show. That you can use, we humans have a third brain, which we don't uh, put to any good use, but if you did, imagine what you could do. Uh, and he has uh, taken this uh, to, uh, to use by uh, getting the cows to milk only by using telepathy, using his third brain. So this is uh, when he has discovered that it actually works and he's running around with his friend in town shouting, you know, the third brain works, the third brain works, and then he's going to show it to the, to the, um, 
to the villagers and he actually succeeds so this car starts milking then the CIA comes and kidnaps him because they want to use his fantastic <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very funny story this one is not uh, funny at all uh, that's not from the same issue I think it's from a special issue uh, uh, devoted to to uh, to gender questions and uh, it's basically a story about a young man who sits in his flat and overhears uh, um, another man beating his wife next door so it's a very dark story uh, about uh, domestic abuse um, now the common denominator of many of the stories in Tuk Tuk is that they depict the underprivileged sections of Egyptian society in the city and in the countryside and all the stories they have nearly are from the Egyptian streets, which is rarely, I think, treated with empathy in the Egyptian press. Now, what are the reasons for using Amiya in Tuk Tuk? And then uh, Mohammed Shanawi had some good comments on that when I met him uh, a year ago or so. He said that this kind of magazine wouldn't work with Fosha. We want a magazine that depicts reality, a magazine that's funny and at the same time critical, criticizing society. It's not logical to use Fusha when you depict people walking the streets and poor people. A beggar talking of Fusha? That's a joke. Uh, so, it's not only the medium that this is a comic series, but also the concern with depicting social reality, which dictates the use of Amiya. The Tuk Tuk collective, uh, the, the people behind Tuk Tuk, they are concerned with authenticity in their art. And the same attitude was voiced by another prominent Egyptian comics writer, Magdi Eshafei, and he has written Egypt's first and until now only uh, fully-fledged graphic novel, which is called Metro. And Eshafei, he said that the problem of mainstream Egyptian comics is that it employs a language that's not truthful. Uh, and he used the example of Mickey Mouse and these kinds of uh, publications. He said it's not truthful. For comics, it's a popular art form, and you need to employ the language that's used in the streets. So, a uh, uh, quest for authenticity. Then, there is a third reason for using Amiya, uh, which become apparent when I probed a bit deeper. Um, there is an element of social and political criticism connected to uh, most of the stories in uh, Tuk Tuk, even though they do it in a funny way. And the choice of Amiya becomes connected to a wider social political project. Both Shinnewi and Ashafai, they aim to show the underbelly of society, the dark sides of Egyptian society. And their treatment of uh, this underbelly implies social and political criticism of the state of human rights, corruption and sexual harassment. And their own attitude to, for example, sexuality is very open-minded and explicit, also graphically, as you can see in, in, uh, if, you, if you browse through the pages. And this is in contrast to the taboos on this topic in most public discourse. So the very project is critical and challenges the elite culture of public writing and reading. Okay. Now, I've tried to show that the choice to write in Amiya is motivated by different factors in Ihna, where style is uh, important, and Tuk Tuk, where the medium itself and the quest for authenticity is important. Now, what they share is the tendency to treat serious social and political issues in the vernacular idiom. And this is a break with established practice. And both publications also challenge public morals, because as I told you, Tuk Tuk has had some of the issues removed from shelves because of the, the drawings. So, in other words, I think it's pretty obvious that there's a socio-political dimension to the combination of language and content in these types of publication. The, con the, 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 the combination of language and content has socio-political implications. And now I try to flesh out three such implications. And this is uh, where it becomes a bit speculative, but uh, yeah, I can hear your uh, reactions um, when, when you ask me questions or critically comment. Okay, I think that one central uh, concern, one central concern in uh, these publications is to represent marginalized groups in society, the little man and the little woman, and to do this in their own language, in Amiya. 
So a main character in Tuk Tuk is this guy. I don't even know his name, uh, but he's he's in all the issues of Tuk Tuk, uh, like a kind of Bram character. He's a poor middle-aged parking lot attendant. The attendant. He's got a wife and two children, and he embodies values of charity, of kindness, and solidarity. And in this episode, uh, he gives refuge to a Chinese tourist who has fallen victim to trafficking. He finds her actually in a trash bin. There she is. Uh, and so uh, he and his family gives refuge to her. And he fights and outsmarts a gang of street thugs and so on. He's a very kind man. Other stories in Tuk Tuk feature lonely people in the megalopolis of Cairo and alienated youngsters who escape the dreariness of their lives with, you know, drugs and buried, burying themselves in TV and porn magazines and so on. This story is depicting uh, some of that. I don't know if you can see it clearly. But uh, it depicts you know, the lives of uh, the little man and woman. Gives voice to groups and concerns that are not necessarily uh, highlighted in mainstream media discourse. Uh, I think their use of Amiya contributes to the feeling that they don't look at these groups that they write about from outside, from above or outside, but that they look uh, at them eye to eye in their own terms, in a vernacular idiom. So it gives them uh, a voice. The second implication, I think, is that uh, the vernacular idiom of Ehna and Tuk Tuk reflect an urban environment. They employ the main urban dialect, the Kyrene dialect, and they contribute to a culture of informality. And this is where they fit into a larger picture that's uh, discernible in Cairo and uh, all the major cities in Egypt uh, at this time. Uh, we have had for a number of years uh, uh, development. We've got lots of new uh, publishing houses. Uh, Eva has written about that. Publishing houses popping up, uh, bookstores uh, popping up all over the place. And they have brought new and unconventional authors onto the literary scene. And the sarcastic literature and the sarcastic style, the slow beserker, is part of this trend. And you can see it's it's kind of a it's kind of a hip and informal and uh, homely style. This picture here, that's from a bookshop called Kutub Khan in uh, Cairo. And it's typical of the many bookshops where you can sit at a cafe. There's there's, gone, there's often you know an espresso machine somewhere, and you can sit and read books, and magazines, and browse. Uh, and there are events taking place uh, at night time. Uh, and this coolness is reinforced by the design of the books they often sell, like this one. They are written in Amiya. Both of these are written purely in Amiya, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, one called uh, uh, what's the English translation? Uh, men are from Bula and women are from Faisal Street, uh, which is a play on John Gray's yeah. bestseller, you know, uh, Men are from Mars and Women are from Venus. So it, it's about uh, the, the difficulties of young middle aged uh, Egyptian newlyweds, and it's quite uh, hilarious at times. And then there's uh, this, uh, a book without name, Kitab Malouch Isn, by Ahmed Al Asili, a kind of media phenomenon in Egypt, which is about nothing much really, just a series of essays about everything that. Uh, he thinks about, uh, and he sold a lot of books by writing about that. Uh, but it's cool. That's that's uh, that's the cool and informal. That's the point. Uh, often they would deal with serious issues, not only uh, trivialities. But I mean, the, the problems of getting married and newly wed people in in Cairo. That's that's uh, something a lot of people talk about, and it's serious. But they treat it in a humorous and funny way. Uh, and the books are often written in Amiya, or in a mix of Amiya and Fusa. Uh, an important part of this trend, and this is really, now I get into speculation, and I'll see if you accept that or not. An important part of this trend is that it seemingly leads to the rise of Amiya as an accepted written variety alongside Fusa. It doesn't take Fusa's pace necessarily, but it rises up alongside it. Uh, you can find it as the dominant variety in a number of media, like comics and Facebook pages, and as variety alongside Fusa in publications where Fusa used to enjoy near-monopoly, like in books. And in doing this, these authors 
and the text producers of Ahna and Tuktuk, they're not out of touch with the general linguistic climate uh, among ordinary literate uh, Kyrenes. We did the survey as part of this bigger project that both uh, Eva and you and I are uh, part of. A survey in Egypt with, the, with about 2,400 respondents. And um, you can see the results to one of the questions here, or two of them. 76% say that it's easier to understand things written in AMIA. And 57% think, agree, or strongly agree, to the statement that AMIA has a place as a written language. So this is something that's gaining quite a lot of traction in, uh, in Egypt, and this is something new uh, compared to what we know and what has been the traditional view on uh, the Arabic uh, linguistic situation. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'm going to skip a bit. Um, okay, we can only speculate what this development will lead to. But one guess is that it will affect the status and prestige of Fusfa in the long run. Not in 5 or 10 years' time, but maybe in 50. When you no longer need to master Fusfa to be able to communicate effectively in writing and actually get your things published to a wide audience, it may contribute to the process that Latin went through hundreds of years ago. And it may also lead to a codification or a standardization of AMIA. But that's a guess. Now to the third uh, implication, which is where it starts to get difficult, uh, at least for me, but I'll uh, make a shot at it. Now, Ihna and Tuktuk are new and, in a way, alien kinds of publications in Egypt. Tuktuk, uh, by the of being just completely unknown, uh, the, the idea of having comics for grown-ups, Ihna, by the of being a kind of magazine that was for the elite previously. It was often written in English, these kinds of magazine and it was for the rich people, very, very small sections of society. They didn't you know, care so much about the rest of Egyptian society. Uh, so they're, they're alien. Um, now, they, now, they both use Amiya instead of English or Fusa to uh, depict Egypt in an authentic way. And I wonder where this places them in the current social political landscape in Egypt. Um, and what, what, I, what I think is that we can interpret their linguistic strategy of writing in Amiya as a kind of clever navigation in very difficult political waters. Uh, if we leave Egypt for a moment, there is an interesting article on code switching in India and writing uh, Hindi in English language newspapers in, uh, in India, uh, written by a person called Bhatt in uh, 2008. And but notes that this code switching between Hindi and English reflects social struggles and writers switch between codes. Uh, this, this, uh, this reflects their position in relation to, uh, to social and political struggles. Uh, and but draws on Humi Baba, the famous cultural theorist, who talks of a third space. By writing, by mixing Hindi and English in the newspapers, they create a third space, a space where they put themselves in between. They are not, you know, part of the English-speaking elites and alienated from all the Hindi-speaking people, uh, but neither are they completely traditional. They are in between. They don't want to be outside any of these parts of society. They want to, to bridge between them, in a way, and be in between. That's the third space. And for Baba, the concept of third space opens up a critical space for cultural difference, for hybridity, and for cultural translation, instead of antagonism and walls between different parts of society and different cultures. And I think that this remark is relevant to the Egyptian case, because a persistent feature of Egyptian elite discourse, both before and after the 2011 revolution, has been its xenophobic attitude. Uh, and this, uh, in this discourse, activists and demonstrators who are, who are critical to the powers that be, uh, no matter if those powers are the military or the Muslim Brothers, they're described as people have, who have dubious connections to foreign elements, foreign agendas, and agendas that are harmful to the Egyptian national interest. It's, it's a way of treason, of treason, 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 treason. Thanks. 
Now in this climate, I think the choice to publish critical articles and stories in a mix of Amiya and Fusa is interesting, because many of the writers belong to a stratum of society that's multilingual, and where especially English is widespread and has been used a lot for writing uh, critically about society. Uh, as I mentioned, there are and there have been English language publications that resemble Ehna, but they're written in English. So I think that by opting to writing in Arabic script, and for a large part in the Kyrian urban vernacular, Ehna's contributors reach out to an audience that's wider than the cosmopolitan Anglophile crowd, and they simultaneously place themselves within the Egyptian Arab identity sphere. And in this way, the choice of code helps to navigate a complex cultural and social landscape and signals also that they're in between. They want to criticize many aspects of society, but they won't, don't want to place themselves outside it or above it, if you will. Uh, Charles Hirschkin, he, uh, just to uh, end with that, he has noted a similar uh, development on Egyptian, uh, in the Egy Egyptian blogosphere, where religious differences are overcome and a critical ideology is developed through a common unifying language, which is marked by code mixing and code switching between Amiya and Fusa. And he says that there is a recognition among the bloggers of the necessity of creating a language of political agency that's capable of encompassing the heterogeneity of commitments, religious and otherwise, that characterize Egyptian society. And he says that such writing highlights its independence from the dominant discourses of Egyptian political life that circulate via print and television media. So they navigate uh, different, uh, a difficult uh, political landscape and uh, I think that uh, they do that quite successfully. And I promised that I would uh, include Spongebob. And now I come to the very end because I think that uh, as it happens, Spongebob nicely illustrates the humorous touch associated with written Amiya, the blending of the international and the local, and social criticism. Uh, so it's a nice illustration of how Tuk Tuk carves out this third space for itself. You can see two relevant pages from a story. This is the story where you have Spongebob puppets are being used uh, to gain access to social clubs and sporting clubs in Cairo, where people sell, uh, sell drugs to, to kids. You know, they put the drugs inside the mouth of the dog and they get out these uh, kids. And uh, at this particular point in the story, uh, the gang leader, which you can see above there, when he's laughing, ha 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 ha, like, because it's very evil. He's laughing because he's, he explains to the uh, to the hero of the story how he has made a fortune out of selling drugs in this way, and now he's going to kill our hero after having told him all this. But at the crucial moment, a caterpillar comes and uh, bangs him in the head. Uh, it's just a uh, coincidence, typically Kyrene coincidence, where the driver just happened to demolish the wrong house. <laughs> uh, stuff like that happens, uh, as everybody knows, in Cairo. And so uh, the evil man dies while grabbing for his little uh, Spongebob uh, doll, which I hold there, <laughs> whose dad is, uh, whose dad is boys, <laughs> he, he screams there. So he dies, and our hero, that's uh, in the next uh, panel, our hero can go and uh, liberate the poor Chinese tourist which uh, was taken hostage by these uh, terrible people. You can see her talking in Chinese there. Uh, which is also a nice, nice touch, I think. Uh, and saves the day, basically, for everybody. His family and the poor Chinese tourist. And he wins over the bad guys. And uh, by doing this, Tuk Tuk exposes uh, the gang culture and uh, through the story also the corruption that exists in Egyptian society. So, yet another absurd night passes in Cairo. Uh, the little man beats the gang. It's fun, it's got a critical edge, and it's in 100% Egyptian, including the Chinese characters. Thank you.